Thanks for having me here. Um, it's a beautiful city. I think my battery is a little bit dead, so that's why I'm around here. Um, how many of you have heard of uh, OWASP Top 10? All of you, right? Great. Um, how many of you have heard of Automated Threats Handbook? Awesome. That's like a couple more than I thought. Great. So, OWASP is known for OWASP Top 10. OWASP Top 10 tracks like, you know, web application vulnerability issues that are associated with, you know, our weaknesses in the software like SQL injection or, you know, injection type of attacks and so on, right? And that gets refreshed like every three or four years now. Um, but automated threads, uh, we track these uh, bots and uh, automated scripts that are taking advantage of uh, legitimate features in the software. So for example, things like login page, right, or, you know, uh, checkout page, or how you check the balance in your uh, credit card, and so on, to, um, uh, So this project started, like, back in 2015, and uh, Colin Watson is one of my uh, collaborators and co-leads uh, co on this project. And since then, you know, this has become a, basically a de facto industry standard in buying and uh, selling and finding solutions for these automated attacks. So this talk is about that, you know, how we gonna, uh, how we categorize this, categorize and, you know, create an ontology for these attacks and how you can use it. And also it will be like a call for collaboration and so on. So a little bit of my background and what I do, uh, I work at uh, Verizon and as part of Verizon that uh, does like um, content delivery network. So we have like a lot of uh, these uh, web servers that are throughout the world. And from that vantage point, I get to see, you know, all this uh, good, both good and bad web, web traffic, uh, good like, you know, uh, good, could be like good bots like Google bots and uh, search engines and so on uh, that are happening, but also a lot of bad and nefarious activities like um, attacks and also the exploits that I'm going to talk about based on these uh, automated scripts. Um, I'm sure this is not working, sorry. Oh, does it? Oh. Oh, d does it have it? Ah, okay. So this is the agenda, you know, we, we, uh, I'll start with like why we started this project in addition to, you know, OWASP Top 10 and all the, all the projects that OWASP has and what this project is about and we'll kind of deep dive into the ontology that we have created and then use cases and what are the threats and what the countermeasures are and, and a little bit of roadmap on, you know, what's next with this project and this handbook. So the problem is this. Right here, we are in 2019, we have uh, secure software frameworks, and we also have like secure software development lifecycle practices and so on. So from the InfoSec point of view, from the AppSec point of view, right, uh, things are like doing great. You know, we uh, take care of this uh, SQL injection and cross-site scripting and vulnerable components and all that. If you do the SDLT, right, but that may not be true for everyone, but you know, if one of us start a project today, then that's how you're going to do it, and then you, you will have a pretty good chance that, you know, your software is going to be uh, fairly robust and reliable. But what about from the ops point of view, right? From the ops point of view, that's what ops guys are saying, like, oh, we see a lot of attacks, and we see a lot of, you know, uh, unwanted traffic coming to us, you know, and you guys are doing everything right that you said about software development, but how can we seeing attacks? Well, one of the reasons is that, you know, no, whether you are secure or not, you'll receive attacks just by being on the internet. And the other part of the reason was that um, you have legitimate features that are not meant to be for mass consumption. It's, they were meant to be for the human users to interact with your software or the application. But the attackers, with their sometimes uh, commercial motivations, they write uh, automated scripts to take advantage of these features and masks, right? So that's what's going on. And then a vendor comes in, I, hey, you know, I have this does it all solution for all the problems that you have. I mean, yeah, th that product exists, right? Everybody sells that product, but that product doesn't exist. So that's the uh, kind of, pro that's a problem that we try to address with this project. Do you have a common vocabulary in describing what these threats are? And 
you know, so, so whether we are a defender or whether you're a builder or whether you're a vendor, you can uh, describe these in a common, uh, common term. So this is the goal of the language uh, of the project, and the project is called OWASP Automated Threats to Web Applications. It is by OWASP standard what we call the uh, lab level, so it's not experimental, it has been quite mature for now, but it's not like a flagship yet, like OWASP Top 10. So we're working toward the goal, but the last project um, a review that was done that we graduated to the lab, um, uh, to the lab status. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, Colin Watson started this project back in 2015. I met him presenting th uh, a version of this, an earlier version of this at a conference, and uh, I, we started to collaborate. So from his point of view, he was uh, having this ontology and all this categorization and connecting to other frameworks and so on, but he didn't have a lot of the um, industry uh, uh, examples or industry practices. And that's why I came in like, you know, I saw a lot of these problems and I had at the time like partial solutions for this and so on. But so uh, we kind of like um, complement each other and we started uh, collaborating on this al along with the project reviewers that we done like about a couple of years ago. And uh, some of the vendors, uh, a couple of names that you see here, uh, they also contributed ideas and uh, uh, data to this. So this is the data from one of the um, vendors in this industry, and this is the latest one. Uh, this is based on 2018 data. So uh, we kind of divide that you know, web traffic into human traffic that's generated by the humans at the end of the other, uh, other end of the connection, but also the bots, like these are the automated threats. And not all bots are bad, right? So the bots are like you know, search engine crawlers and so on. You don't want to uh, interfere with them. You want them to uh, be able to uh, discover your website and be a part of their search engine index. And things like you know, API access and health check, they're part of the infrastructure, they're part of the you know, API-driven um, type of software architecture. So these are all good bot traffic. But if you look at this data, about 20% of the traffic are bad bots. So what are the bad bots? So instead of defining you know, what bots are, we will define like, what the threats that are uh, presented by the bots. So, hence the ontology, right? And we call it OWASP Automated Threat, or some people call it OAT. Um, it's an ontology of unwanted web automation, so bad bots, right? So good bots are, you know, good web automation. And these are not vulnerabilities. And that's important distinguish factor between, you know, this and the OWASP Top 10-like project, is that um, this one focuses on how your legitimate features are being abused by, uh, by, by, the, uh, by the bot. And we started with like a um, 20, and then now we have about 21 uh, threats that we have discovered and categorized that could grow as you know, we discover more patterns and so on. You can think of it as like the patterns of these um, unwanted automation. Uh, this is not a top list. So uh, sometimes people call like OWAS oh, top 20 or so on. This is not top by any means because we don't categorize, uh, sort it by you know, threat or risk or uh, things like that. So here are the uh, 20 ones. Um, so a couple of changes that we made to the list since uh, the last version of the book. Uh, so the product of this project is a book. And currently we are at version uh, 1.2 of the book. And since between 1.1 and 1.2, we added this uh, new category of threat called the in, uh, denial of inventory. And that's the exhaustion of inventory that are in the, uh, uh, the merchant's uh, you know, warehouse, or uh, however you call it, in the digital equivalent. And we renamed uh, Capture Bypass to Capture Defeat. Uh, bypass meant that you know, there's some uh, issue with the Capture implementation. But here, Capture Defeat means that you know, uh, these automated scripts come up with like, some uh, AI or uh, optical uh, recognition and so on, so these features do uh, to do feed capture. And the rest of the stuff like, you know, scalping, scraping, skewing, sniping, spamming, and so on. Uh, so we, I will go into some of these examples, but, you know, the book will have all these uh, uh, outline and catalog. So what are the use cases? What are the use cases of this project and the book? It's, if you're a security architect, right, so this should lead you to 
defining you know, software security requirements and architecting it according to these requirements and building it and so on. So not just about like, you know, hey, don't have SQL injection, use these libraries. This is also about like, think about this automated login abuse problem and have countermeasures built into your software. And also from the security management perspective, you know, uh, they can share this information with peers in their sector, and also they can make intelligent decisions about, hey, these attacks are uh, relevant for us, and we see that a lot in the industry, and hence, you know, we should spend more time and money in uh, addressing them versus, you know, these are some threats that, you know, we don't really see in our industry and so on. And of course, you know, from the security analyst, security operations point of view, these are helpful in both you know, reporting it to either to different uh, organizations in your industry or just within your uh, company, and you now have the consistent uh, vocabulary to describe these. And of course, you know, when th this also helps the penetration testing or the red teams, not only that they need to discover these um, vulnerabilities like the traditional ones, but also they need to uh, have an eye toward what kind of legitimate features can be automated, automatically abused. And especially, you know, when you start the vendor relationship, then when you start, you know, asking for uh, bids and quotes and so on, this purchasing department can start using that uh, terminology to like, hey, we need solutions to address these threats. And Mr. Vendor, you know, do you have the solution? Instead of like, you know, having to buy this does it all solution. And of course, you know, this could also, this, this will also help vendors in a way that they can describe their services and products in ways that, you know, we all understand. So as of 2019 today, uh, what's new? Um, we published the latest uh, 1.2 version of the book uh, about a little more than a year ago. And like I mentioned earlier, we added a new category of threat called the um, denial of inventory. And we renamed one. Uh, we did some cleanup in the, um, in the typos and type settings and uh, some clarification on some of the co uh, countermeasures, like how we describe it. So denial of inventory, so that's a new one that we added. And we kind of debated over a little bit on, you know, do we need a new category? We don't want to create a new category just for the sake of it. So we try to fit this problem into the existing 20 categories. And we turn out that, you know, it doesn't really fit any anyway. So what is denial of inventory? Well, think about an airline, like a discount carrier or something like that. And they have these special promotion phase, like, um, you know, uh, I was working with a com uh, company in Hong Kong, so like go to Phuket for like 20 Hong Kong dollars, you know, round trip or whatever, right? That's, maybe they have five tickets of their price and the other, uh, other tickets are like normal price, right? So what, what happens to them was like there were some bots that put all this uh, inventory, all the seating inventory, not just for the five promotional fare, but you know, all like 120 or whatever, or 200 tickets on that fly, they put it in the basket and they keep doing that and they turn around and sell it in the, you know, a third, a third party market at the regular price or a little bit less than the regular price and only when they have that uh, buyer on the other side, they turn around and buy it from this, you know, airline's website, right? So from airline's point of view, yeah, the ticket got sold, but it didn't get sold to the right person. But as a side consequence, all the tickets that are available are held up in the checkout basket for however long you know they time out. But if it times out that these are bots, right? So they're gonna uh, put it in the basket again. So the entire inventory gets held up in the. Uh, so we we created this category to um, uh, describe that problem, and these are the little um, uh, diagrams or the you know um, uh, boxes and circles that we use to describe this problem. So usually uh, the yellow ones are the, uh, the assets that we are trying to protect and the type of interactions and so on. So this is uh, basically you know, a preview of, of the book, like how the book is structured. So we described the ontology, uh, 21 now, and we added more examples. Uh, that, that's when I started collaboration with Colin on these. And we added also countermeasure classes. So I'll get into what countermeasures are and how we classify them into different uh, type of countermeasures. And of course, you know, use case scenarios in the uh, reference. A little bit of status about this, you know, uh, this, this was last review as, a, as an OWASP project. And my goal is to have it reviewed again later this year. 
So let's walk through some other examples, right? So this is what we call the account takeover. This is what usually business folks will describe it, or you know how it gets bubbled up to the management. Like we have account takeover problem, right? But the, in this project, kind of breaks it down into the threats that lead to the account takeover problem. So in this case, you know uh, these two threats that we describe here, like cred credential cracking and credential stuffing they can lead into account takeover problems. So they, they sound similar, but they're two different type of attacks, and hence two different type of threats. So how are they different? So this is credential stuffing, right? In credential stuffing threat, the attacker will get, acquire this you know, credentials from the, either from the black market or somebody breach you know, uh, user data, and because we tend to reuse our passwords and we, use, we tend to use our email address as a username, if you try enough, even if you get like 1% or even 0.5% or success rate, if you try enough, you'll get enough accounts to break into that account. Right? And, and you don't have to do, uh, repeatedly do that. You can do that through the distributed way. You can kind of fly under the uh, radar by like just doing it like you know, two, three requests a minute or something like that. To be, or you can even uh, take advantage of the uh, botnet that you can rent to send these requests. That is different from credential cracking, and this is more like the brute force cracking, right? So you will use uh, one account name, and then you'll, you know, to like, you know, password one, password two, password three, and so on. And this will be a little easier to detect because you'll see, you know, one username associated with a lot of uh, failures. But the other one, uh, credential stuffing, will be a little harder to detect because. It only happens once, right? So for me, my email account and whatever the credential that I lost, or the you know some website lost, it'll it'll be tried, and if it doesn't work, then there'll be another person's emails. So that's a subtle difference that you know you have to be mindful of when you're building the uh, counter mission and so on. So the similar thing, um, credit card abuse, right? So the business problem, like you know, hey, you know my credit card chargeback rates are high, you know, how do we address it? But the technical threats for that are like what we call the carding, uh, card cracking, and cashing out. You know, cashing out is probably easier to understand, but uh, what about the difference between uh, carding and cracking? So one is to do, what has to do with um, just to check the validity of the credit card, like whether, you know, that card is a valid combination of you know, the valid format, valid uh, check some type of uh, credit card data, and also like if it is like a store credit card and so on, you know, if it is still valid in that system. Card cracking is basically brute forcing, right? So it is very similar to like, you know, uh, credential stuffing and credential cracking, but, uh, you know, it's two different uh, types of uh, threats. And then cashing out. Cashing out is like where the payday comes to the criminals, right? So um, I work, a couple of companies ago, I worked with this service. Uh, let's call it like um, somebody who sells their time on the internet, right? So it could be like a psychic, or it could be like um, you know uh, some advice, relationship advice, or you know tax advice, or you know you just need to talk to someone and you call the number, and you know they will match. And what what the criminals were doing was that they are registering a lot of. Uh, Accounts on both sides, right? One on the uh, on the psychic side, and the other on the seekers, or like, you know, people who are seeking advice side. And the people who are buying that advice is paying with a stolen credit card, but they are getting they also they're the same people, so they're getting paid through the system. And although the system takes about 30% cut or whatever the high margin, but it's still you know stolen credit card, and you get some money out of it. So. These are the type of scenarios. It could be the physical goods too. Like sometimes people get recruited to, hey, there's a job that you know your job is all to like you know uh, repack this uh, goods like, because we people are sending it as a gift and they don't want the recipient to know that this comes from you know Amazon or Walmart or what have you. So like oh I want all you have to do is like you know take it out of this box, put it in a new box, wrap it with a wrapping paper, and you get money. But then what they're doing is to sending. Um, to send these uh, goods that are bought with a stolen credit, credit cards to this uh, third party, and sometimes that makes it to the news. 
The other problem that I have seen is like e-commerce companies, uh, you know, get, get their data getting skewed because you know there are a lot of um, scrapers that are running, and you know they always keep uh, keep an eye toward like you know what's the ratio of like you know look versus buy, and that ratio will be off when you have a lot of bots visiting your website, right? So ad fraud is uh, another one like similar uh, cashing out strategy. Like you have. Um, you, you know, you set up your website with a lot of uh, third-party advertisement uh, from like Google AdWords and so on, and, but you have a lot of bots visiting your site, so you know, your click rate will be high and your impression will be high, and you turn around and you know, claim like, hey, you know, uh, we serve like this many impressions of ad. And so skewing is what I described earlier. And of course, you know, having to deal with these uh, unwanted automated traffic has uh, stress on your infrastructure, so even uh, whether you're using uh, cloud infrastructure with auto-scaling or your on-prem, you have to have like, enough capacity and that costs you money. Right? And the technical threats that lead to this problem are denial of service, right? and you can have a lot of bots you know, just make like, a lot of uh, nefarious database uh, query type of stuff. The best one to do that is to look for a description in the um, product catalog with the, some random junk word, so the database will have to do the um, uh, entire, you know, unstructured and index uh, search on the description field of the product. But since the, the, these terms don't exist, you know, it has to go through the entire database and so on. And of course, vulnerability scanning—that's pretty much, you know, understood uh, issue. But and also, they can be buying stuff, but they can be in the they can be the wrong people who are buying it. Uh, scalping is uh, kind of the issue that I mentioned earlier about the uh, you know, budget airline that leads to the denial of inventory problem. But the other, the other threat that they have with this is this uh, scalping, you know, their, their goods being sold in the black market. And sniping is like, you know, when you time it right, especially like an auction site, and you time it like, you know, just like two seconds before the auction ends or something, it's hard for a human user to compete with that when you have your uh, buying bot you know, program to be that way. So OK, so uh, what are people doing to defend against these? So that's a version 1.1 of the book. You know, we survey these uh, countermeasure methods. We put them into different classes and different phases of software development lifecycle that you can apply them to. So these are the 14 different countermeasures that are in no particular order. And the way that we organize them is through, uh, 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 in a couple of ways. So one is like uh, how, in what phase of the SDLC you can apply these techniques and, uh, of countermeasure. Right, so, the first, uh, so we divide it into two different uh, uh, types of people, like builders and defenders. So builders are the people that who are willing and able to make code changes. Right. Sometimes you know you, you inherited code, you bought systems and software, but you know it's you, you don't know how that works. You don't have the ability to change it, or you may have the source code, but you don't you don't have people who can work with the code anymore. But if you do have people who can work with the code, and especially you know in the beginning of the software development project, you can apply some of these techniques. In other cases, you know the, the defender comes in and they must work around the system. So whether that be like providing another layer of protection or having a module that is inside the web server and so on to basically work around the code so that you can detect. And it could be like log analysis. You know, it could be part of the proxies or content delivery networks and so on to uh, defend that vulnerable system uh, by working around it. And then we uh, define these uh, countermeasures as three different types. One is to prevent, one is to detect, and one is to recover. Right? They could be they're pretty self-explanatory. You know, prevent great if you can prevent it, but a lot of times, you know, in some cases, it may not be possible to prevent it. So, like, can you can you detect it, and can you recover it? Can you um, you know make this impact limited? So here is one example. You know, uh, we call a rate, basically, kind of rate controls against. You know how many times a function can be invoked. So, for example, like on the uh, login page, you know, if single IP can you know try to log in maybe no more than two times a minute or something like that, right? You can put these controls, and it's not just you know uh, this is that was a very simple example, but it, 
It may also be like, you know, oh, you can only do, you know, X amount of dollars per transaction, you know, and you can combine that with other countermeasure uh, techniques like uh, device fingerprinting, you know, IP reputation, uh, whether they come from like, uh, you know, cloud infrastructure versus uh, consumer home IPs and things like that. You can use uh, these different types of information and different type of countermeasures together. But the goal of the rate is to limit, you know, uh, what a legitimate user does versus like an, what automated threat will do. And these bots will adjust to that. They will figure out like, oh, you know, you allow only one login per minute. So, okay, you know, I'll, I'll only do like, you know, one per minute, but I'll use a botnet to do that. So there will be other things that you need to, uh, you need to do, but this, this, this is a good starting point. So this type of countermeasure can be done doing your, uh, well, uh, in your code, right? You can put that kind of inherent controls in your code while you're designing it and writing it, or you can do it at a, another layer, like at a proxy level or something by monitoring, or monitoring your logs and so on. And I call it like, you know, this is about protect, pre preventing and detecting. You can use it for both purposes. Uh, this probably wouldn't give you a lot of recovery. Uh, this probably is applicable to all kinds of threats and by just by, you know, limiting how much damage you, they can, it can be done to you, you have, um, uh, you have some advantage. Maybe some exceptions, but it'll be, you know, corner cases. Another is device fingerprinting, right? So a lot of times, you know, uh, there is, uh, the, the bots evolve over time, right? The numbers of the bots are like just, you know, a Perl script or a Python script that, that they don't even bother to change the user agent. So it'll be like Python library and so on in the user agent. These are easy to detect and these are easy to block. But bots become more sophisticated over time and especially with the automation framework like Selenium and Phantom.js and so on, you actually have a browser, functioning browser, and sometimes it's at the consumer IP that, you know, home IP that is being compromised on some device behind that IP. So it's harder to tell, um, you know, whether it's a human or not. But, you know, the uh, countermeasure techniques also evolve, and like, by device fingerprinting, like, you know, hey, if you're a real user using this browser, you will have these fonts installed, you'll have the screen resolution of this site, it's not a headless browser, and your mouse movement may be, you know, uh, this, this speed and so on. So it can be pretty elaborate, but that requires, you know, running uh, JavaScript in the context of the browser to, to make sure. And this is effective against like scraping type of activities, like somebody trying to go through entire catalog to scrape your prices so they can beat you in the shopping comparison side. But this may not be too effective against like a single request things like a login or something. Again, this can be apply during uh, either as a part of the system or software that you're building or around it. But uh, either way, you know, uh, this is um, preventing and detecting recovery wouldn't make a lot of sense. And this is applicable basically against most of the uh, threat. But fingerprinting as a countermeasure doesn't really help against fingerprinting threat. Fingerprinting threat is basically just figuring out what kind of software version you're running. And usually, you know, if you're Headers leak about the information that, that could be bad for you. Capacity, that could be like, you know, uh, having elastic infrastructure to scale up and down. It, it can help and it can also, you know, cost you. It could be like using a content delivery network or something like that to kind of uh, disperse the load. But again, you know, that, that has cost. Or it could be like, you know, just having unlimited amount of supply of goods and so on, right? But we don't judge like, you know, which uh, method is more effective than other. We just discover these methods and you know, uh, put them into categories and catalog them. Again, capacity, when they are applicable, you can do it as part of the software or part of the system outside the software. This will prevent and this will also help you recover once you have more capacity. And it's usually, um, you know, if you're subject to like denial of service type of attacks, uh, this helps a lot, or vulnerability scanning, just by, you know, having more capacity that you don't have to deal with this uh, consequences of these threats. So when we approach this problem, we not only look at it from the technical standpoint, but we also look at it from the business standpoint, because at the end of the day, this is the business problem. The good thing about 
this problem is it's, it's a quantifiable problem in that a lot of times when I talk to the customers who have this problem, they know how much it is cost. This problem is costing them, and that's because they have to pay for the infrastructure. For example, airline ticket issue. Airlines will have the front end web page, but the back end um, of keeping the seat inventory and selling the inventory is handled by a few back end providers. And they have to pay for every lookup that whenever a consumer comes in and searches the flight through their front web page, they have to pay for that, right? So, okay, sidetracking a little bit. So, this. this this is a business problem. So we also look at it from the how are the, you know, how we can prevent it from the business standpoint. So it could be like a contract and terms and conditions that, you know, like for example, if it's an ad fraud case, you know, you get your maximum payout for serving the ads from the ad inventory is like X amount of dollars. So by putting these business level controls, you can address these problems. And sharing our information, and this project is part of that, you know, how we can share this information in a proper context and proper uh, vocabulary. So, you know, OWASP is a great community to share, but it could also be like your regional cert, you know, your industry groups and so on. Yeah, so now that, you know, we have this project and the handbook, which is free, it's on the OWASP website. If you want a printed copy, you can also get a printed copy. It costs like about $10 for the print. You know, we don't, we don't make any money. The, the, uh, the book is free. The printing press will charge you some money. So now that you know InfoSec can describe like, you know, I have this issue that I need some solution. And Offset like, yeah, you know, uh, the marketing is also complaining that they have some issues about, you know, this problem. And we need some solution to buy this. And then the vendor can come and sell this. Or you can build it on your own. Like, you know, all these methods are cataloged in this book. It's a matter of like, you know, it makes more sense for you to build it on your own or buy it from someone. So this is Colin, uh, my collaborator and, and, you know, the founder of this project. It's a little bit about me. Um, next things that we're trying to do, uh, we have a project showcase tomorrow. So if you want to have a more, you know, interactive discussion, please come by. And uh, we need more collaborators. You know, it's right now, it's pretty much me for this project. So, <laughs> um, and my goals are to like, you know, have a project review uh, in fall, maybe at the AppSec USA um, in September. Uh, do we need to add additional threads? Do we need to discover additional countermeasures if you have experience with that? And we do need, uh, you know, more cleanup, more readability. Right now, it kind of reads like a phone book. <laughs> um, and translations. And I was talking to um, uh, the guy from China, Owasa, he said, like, oh, this has already been translated to, uh, to Chinese. So that's great, but, you know, if we can do that for other languages, or also, like, you know, if you're bilingual, multilingual, if you want to be uh, a reviewer of these books, I want these translations to be accurate. So, yeah, um, I think we have time for one or two questions. Any questions? All right, well, yeah. Um, hello, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, currently, uh, showing the capture, one of the m most uh, popular and main countermeasures uh, against automatic uh, attacks and so on. But in the same time, right now, it it's really looks break it, uh, breakable and so on. Uh, what do you think will be the next generation basic level of or maybe basic countermeasure against automatic attacks? Yeah, so one school of thought on that is if you have to serve capture, you already are doing a very poor job of detecting bots. So your, you know, the goal of the bot mitigation is to figure out so that you don't need to serve the capture. And when you serve the capture, you the goal of that is to like capture not be soft. Like basically, the bot will just go away that this is too difficult. So it depends on like how accurately you can detect these attacks without relying on the capture solving capability, right? And on the other side, there are some you know better capture solutions, right? That's 
you know, there's the companies around it, like uh, use more mathematical models and lighting and shading and so on to make the capture solving more difficult. But, you know, it's any time that you have to self capture, it impedes with the user experience and, you know, both the consumers, uh, the businesses like banks and so on, they don't like capture. But, you know, it may be the defense of last resort. Any other? Well, thank you so much for coming. And yeah, please come by tomorrow to have a more discussion.